This episode is brought to you by PodCash, a collaboration between Racket and Stir. PodCash is free cash for your podcast. PodCash gave away $100,000 to up-and-coming podcasters as a way to support insanely creative and inspiring podcasters. I ought to know because I'm one of those podcasters that received a winning cash sum. I know how difficult it can be to get a podcast off the ground. And this is why I'm so excited to have been a podcast winner. I would have gone nuts for something like this when I was first starting out. If podcasting has been on your to-do list or you're already a podcaster, go to podcast.com to stay up to date with future podcast happenings. That's podcast.com. And I thank all who voted for me and made me a podcast winner. That's podcast.com. I am Al Cooley from Ghosts in the Valley Podcast. This is Jordan Klein with Fireside Paranormal Podcast, and you're listening to Ghosts in the Valley Podcast with Al Cooley. Hello there. This is Eleanor Wagner, host of the Paranormal UK Radio Network's Strange and Scary World and Coast to Coast Entertainment Network's Creeping It Real. I'm the author of the Sussex County Hauntings and Warren County Hauntings book series, and you are listening to the Ghosts in the Valley podcast. This is Jerry Ayers with Supernatural Investigators of Minnesota, and you're listening to Ghosts in the Valley podcast. Hi, my name is Wendy M. Cope, and I'm the author of A Gray Resort and my newest book, An Awakening, that just came out this past January. And you're listening to Ghosts in the Valley with Al Cooley. And I am Al Cooley, host of Ghosts in the Valley podcast. Welcome to Ghost in a Valley Podcast. I'm your host, Al Cooley. Today I have JT. He is the host of the Paranormal Sun Podcast. JT is out of New Zealand. I want to thank JT for working out our time difference and being on the show today. I'll be right back with JT from the Paranormal Sun right after these brief messages. Are you looking for a new book to read? Check out my newest book, An Awakening, by Wendy M. Cope, last name spelt K-O-K. Basically, it's a story of good versus evil, and these things slowly start taking over the residents of this small northern town of Nielsville, Wisconsin, and I would love it if you would read it. My books are available on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Book Baby Bookshop, everywhere really, and you can find me at wendymcopeauthor.com. Okay, tonight I have JT. He is the host of the Paranormal Sun podcast out of New Zealand. You can say we are like time traveling. It's Thursday evening here in the the United States, and it's Friday in uh, his neck of the woods in, in New Zealand. And thank you, JT, for working out our time zone difference. We've been talking back and forth for quite a while. Thanks for coming on my podcast and finally making this work. No, no, no problem, Al. Thanks for having me on. It's it's a pleasure. And I did a bit of delving into your back catalog. As I say, I haven't gotten through it all yet. But yeah, you've got some fascinating stories in there. And again, it just goes to show you've been doing this longer than most of us have even known what a podcast is. And when I say that with your documentary and that. You know, we go back to where, you know, pre- internet pre social media so to us our thrill was listening to uh art bell on uh coast to coast radio oh yeah and so if you didn't get that i mean you had to wait (laughs) uh for 
like talk shows on uh, AM radio mainly. But, you know, thank goodness for the Internet, which is a, is a, a blessing in one way. And, uh, of course, you have the good with the bad, you know. Uh, of course. My first question is, what led you to pack up and leave the United States to your new home halfway around the world in New Zealand? Uh, look, that's a that's an excellent question, Al. And it's one of those kind of moments in my life where I could have went down one path or the other. And I just basically being young enough at the time, I just kind of threw the dice and said, well, what the heck? So what had happened was I was working for a grocery chain in Southern California called Albertsons, which it's pared down quite a bit now. But at the time, we were the second largest grocer in North America. We had like 3,500 stores. 140,000 employees. So what I'm saying is it was a good job to have. And at the time, uh, I would have been able to retire at 53 with the pension and health care and all of that. And then along came a five-month strike slash lockout that we had in Southern California. And at the end of it, anyone who wasn't promoted before, and even though I had been performing the duties of a front-end manager, so when you go in the store, the person who's running the tills and counting the cash and all of that, even though I'd been doing that for about four or five months before the strike, when we came back from strike, the directive came down from headquarters to tell all the store managers, oh, look, save money however you can. So in other words, if they weren't promoted officially before, if they get promoted now, they go under this tier B of a contract and they cut back on your pay scale and everything else. And I was really disenfranchised after this, not so much for me because I was still fairly young. I was only in my mid twenties, but a lot of people I knew, husband and wife tandems had lost homes. And also they even butchered the, uh, the pension of people who had already retired because the pension being paid by the union, you could go in and say, well, we're cutting your pension by 30% or whatever. So at that point, I really, I'd been talking to my uh, partner in New Zealand, my wife, and I just said, well, what the heck? Um, we had pioneer blood in our family. I'll roll the dice. Um, I'll go over and I'll see if I like it. And if not, I can always come home. And here we are nearly 20 years later and I haven't gone back. So I came here with a suitcase and a thousand dollars. And yeah, just like all immigrants. I mean, I, I love the US. Obviously, I'm from there. My family goes right back to the Mayflower on my father's side. But for me, this is the best thing I've ever done. With no offense to anyone in the U.S., I miss the U.S., I miss my friends and all that. But for me personally, it's been the greatest thing I've ever done. I've really enjoyed it here. So you are now uh, officially a New Zealand resident? Yeah, I've, I've been a citizen for quite a long time. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty much bedded in here. Yeah, it'll take it'll take a bit of dusting to get this weed out of the cracks. <laughs> You've been there for 20 years. Uh, you picked up the I, I hear a little slight bit of the accent. Yeah, it is funny. My mom used to say to me, she always used to say to me, "Don't forget where you're from." When we would talk, because of that accent difference, and a lot of people struggled to place it overseas, like when people listen to the program. But that's why it's it's a hybrid of me living not only in the U.S., but in various places. I mean, I went from the Northwest to the Midwest to California, and then I moved here. So uh, a lot of people here, they might say to me, oh, are you Canadian? And I'll say, no, I didn't say a boot. I didn't say guy. So no, I'm not Canadian. Uh, no offense to Canadians. I know some lovely Canadians, but no. The fun part is Al, I'll say to people, well, guess, tell me where I'm from. And I've had odd guesses all the way from Wales and Ireland and the UK to South Africa. So, yeah, it is a bit of fun to play the guessing game with people when they don't know. I love accents, you know. And, yeah, I, I, sometimes I tell some of my guests, you know, I'm not making fun of your ask, accent. Yeah. You can go to some place and, and just pick it up like that, you know. Or even if you're working with a coworker that's from somewhere else and all of a sudden you find yourself picking up their their accents and mannerisms. I, I agree, Al. I've done it many times in my life. So I fully understand what you're saying. And plus your wife being a New Zealander. Yeah. So she's New Zealand born, but she's from uh, Samoa. That's where her family's from. But yeah, she's she's got the, the New Zealand accent. And it, it is funny because it's just our relationship with Australia is very similar to Canada and the U.S., it's like we'll tease each other, but it's kind of big brother, little brother. Yeah, we, we have a lot of fun with Australians because as as much as in the U.S., you'll go, oh, well, your accent is almost the same. But here you can spot an, an Aussie a mile off when they say something and, and vice versa. When if you're in uh, if you're in Australia, they know straight away that you're from New Zealand. <laughs> and plus, if you use mate in every state, so, you know, 
Yeah, yeah. I don't know if, if New Zealanders do that. We do. It's not as embedded as in, in Australia, but yeah, we do. Especially like if you go to a cafe or something, a lot of times you'll you'll use mate. It's almost like the Southern California, but also other parts of the America uh, of America. It's like our equivalent here of saying brother. You know, it's quite. You, you don't want to be informal and 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 say, well, sorry, you don't want to be super formal. But on the other hand, you want to show a little bit of. Uh, connection you know so that's it like you say you'll go oh sorry mate uh, can i just squeeze past you mm-hmm. and, and that's where it gets used a lot you're right i have your podcast the paranormal sun in my uh, podcast library i've listened to a few year of your episodes as well and i i think it's a very well done i love your take that you take your podcast seriously put a lot of interest in time into your episodes oh thank you al coming especially coming from you that's been doing this for a long time Look, I really do appreciate it, and it's always it's just always been my personal opinion that if you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability. I would rather put out 10 episodes that I've trimmed and cleaned up. I mean, I'll leave in the occasional blurb in that because that's fun, you know, when I make a mistake, if I mispronounce uh-huh. a place or something. But yeah, in general, I've just always felt that you put your best foot forward. And it's, it's no different than if you're on the job or if you're cooking dinner, it shouldn't matter if you're serving to the president or you're serving to your family. You just do your best to make the best you can and, and make people uh, appreciate what you do. So, no, thank you, Al. I do appreciate that. That does mean a lot to me. You're welcome. Uh, you could have picked any topic to do a podcast on. I mean, cooking or <laughs> working on cars. I mean, uh, why the paranormal? So, that look, that's an interesting question. And there are a few bits of background on that. One of them is, as you were saying, similar to you, uh, I'm a little bit younger, but um, I'm in my mid 40s. But growing up, I used to run around with the old uh, cassette recorder. Even as as a child, I'd run around recording like I was doing the six o'clock news. And my mom and my sister used to have a bit of a chuckle about it, but they always used to say, oh, I can see you being on on the news one day and uh, my grandma was always convinced that I would end up on TV on a cooking show. So <laughs> when we went through all of this stuff with what the world's gone through since 2020, I was one of the people, I actually lost my job uh, ahead of uh, COVID actually kind of hitting here. And I I had always had on my bucket list that I wanted to write a book. But being me and overcomplicating things, it it couldn't be like, I'll write a 30-page book on, like you say, like a recipe book. Oh, no, I I had to go into it really deep. And I started developing this book, and it was going to be fiction. And as I started getting into it, it, I could see it was a lot of work. And it's not that I'm afraid of the work, but it was just like, wow, this is going to be a lot more time intensive than I thought. Well, in the midst of doing that, um, there was actually, believe it or not, there's a little Chinese um, slash Asian restaurant here in town. And that guy, I followed him for a while because he's really good at helping out people in the community. And he started doing a podcast on Anchor. And I didn't know anything about podcasts. And really, he's the one who got me to look into it and see that there's no bar for entry as far as cost and all of that. And so at that point, I thought, right. Um, I, I want to do something. And I started out with a podcast called The Fortunate Son, which you can still find. But very early on, uh, I found because the tagline for that show was exploring the human condition and uh, the journey of life, something like that. Well, that's a very, very broad spectrum. And what I found out, Al, was very early on, I kind of had two streams. I had that. I had cooking. I had travel. I had politics and all of that. And then I had this other bucket of the paranormal. And I realized very early on that, hey, I I need to split this into two streams. So why I did the paranormal sun and it's based on paranormal and that is just that one, I've always been interested in these things, as you were saying, I mean, coast to coast, before coast to coast, uh, in search of on TV and some of those old documentaries from the seventies and eighties, I was always fascinated by growing up. And I was very fortunate to have a lot of books in our home library from people like John Keogh and uh, a lot of other authors from that time, from the kind of 50s and 60s. So I was interested from a young age. Then you had Unsolved Mysteries. And then later on, like I say, of course, you had Coast to Coast. And then I had some of my own personal experiences, similar to some of the stories that I've heard on your show. And I found out over time, I didn't know what the term was, 
but I've only kind of realized in the last couple of years that I would say that I'm an empath. I tend to feel things much more than I see them. So I'm the, I'm the classic type of person that walks into a place and gets goosebumps. And then I'll find out later that something's happened there that I didn't know about. You talk about writing a book. That's what, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm writing a novel that okay. I grew up in a haunted house for four years. So did I. <laughs> so when I was 12 years old, so, for, so from 12 to 16, 55 years ago, showing my age, it's taken me 55 years to write this book. You know, and I've, I'm a musician too, so I write songs. I, I know how to write, edit, uh, produce, copyright, publish. But writing a novel, man, that's, that's uh, <laughs> how time-consuming and, 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 and me thinking back, because it is fiction, but it's based off a true story. Yes. It's hard to tell somebody like back in 1967, like my mom and dad, they never witnessed anything in a house or did they believe me or my sister and a few others that witnessed this. It's tough when people around you don't believe you. Yes. But you had mentioned Coast to Coast, Nart Bell. If you have a chance, go back and check out three of my episodes I had on UFOs over Trumbull County. That's the uh, county I live in. Right. And actually, Art Bell brought our our county to the national spotlight when he did an uh an episode on this i lived through that so i know what right. he's everything that's on there was true but you know and growing up what kind of a paranormal experience did you have yeah so um uh, real quick I'll, I'll just tell you my art bell thing it, it was the same as you al uh oftentimes in the supermarket you'd work shift work so you might not get off until 12 or 1 and i'd always if i could get away with it and not get in trouble at work i'd always have coast to coast on mm, in mm-hmm. in the background wherever i was so yeah look i'm the same as you and i've caught the first couple episodes of uh of that ufo incident and believe it or not i hadn't actually heard of it so i'll be delving into that So my paranormal uh, experience is really, really the two that have been the most kind of lasting in my life. The first one was when I was quite young, my mom and dad were separated from a young age and my dad lived, oh, at the time he probably lived 30 to 45 minutes away and he rented a, a farmhouse and I would go over and visit and I had a stepbrother who was like in his teen, teen years. So he was kind of 14, 15 and here I was only five, six, seven. And so he was always very protective of me. And there was something about that house. I, I, I'd always, I didn't want to be left alone. Like if my dad and them would go to town and want to leave me there, I never wanted to be alone. And it all kind of culminated with one night uh, during summer vacation. And I was just crying and I was, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to go to sleep. And, and like I say, my stepbrother's in, in the room with me and we've got a house full of guns. I mean, we grew, I grew up in Northern Idaho, so we, we always had mm-hmm. plenty of guns. It wasn't something like I was afraid of burglars or the boogeyman. I, I, de- I didn't know what it was at the time, but I just felt really uneasy. And my dad called my mom. And as you do back in the day, my mom was not impressed to come and collect me at, you know, 10, 30, 11 at night and bring me home. And Anyway, uh, kind of months went on and I was there one day and my dad had a friend over who was a sheriff's deputy. My dad was always a big skeptic to do anything like this. And he started telling the guy, oh, the boy is there's something wrong with the boy. He's wrong in the head. And the guy goes, well, what are you talking about? And he said, well, he's got this bad feeling about this house. And he's always says he feels like he's being watched and everything else. And obviously the kid's been watching too many movies. And, And the guy looks at my dad and he goes, well, the boy's smarter than you are. <laughs> and my dad got really upset about it. He goes, what are you talking about? He said, well, I'm not surprised he's upset in this house. And he goes, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, he goes, a, a guy committed suicide in your kitchen. And uh, my dad goes, yeah, go on, just go ahead and pull the other leg. And he goes, no, here, I'll show you. And he walked in the kitchen and he flecked away the peels of uh, the, the paint on the wall. And he showed my dad where the bullet had impacted the wall after it had gone through this guy's head. And he said to him, he goes, look, I know it happened because I got, I got called out. I was the first one to respond. And he goes, this guy committed suicide in your kitchen. And from that day on, I mean, my dad never really believed it or anything else, but from that day on, he didn't make fun of me anymore because one of his friends, you know, in his mind had told him that there might be something to this. So that when I, when I go in my mind and I go, what's your first time in your life that you kind of had these empath type feelings, I can kind of trace it back to that. Well, years later, when we lived in Illinois, we lived in quite a small town. We only had, I think, about 80 people in the whole town. 
and you would walk around town because we were teenagers and we didn't have a lot to do. It was before I had a license. And the mayor of the town, he was in his 80s, really nice guy named Bob. And he used to walk around with an axe handle because we'd have stray dogs running around and uh, Bob would have this axe handle just in case. And always friendly to him, never had a problem with him. Well, uh, his wife went into hospital around Christmas. Uh, They'd been married over 50 years. And unfortunately, as happens to all of us one day, she passed away in the hospital. And Bob was living alone, and he lived in the house for another four or five months, and then he passed away of what I am sure, I'm convinced, was broken heart syndrome. Mm-hmm. Well, his, his family lived out of town, his kids, and they didn't really want the house, so they put it up for sale. And my parents, being my parents, said, oh, let's buy this house. So we bought the house, and we moved in, and it was a nice house. But I lived upstairs and my parents lived downstairs and I had quite a large bedroom. It was an old wooden house, had wooden floors and wooden windows and all of that. And there was a spare bedroom up there as well. Well, Al, within a few months, I would hear kind of weird things like footsteps and that in the house and windows uh, opening and closing. And I just call out, hey, Bob, how you doing? And every time I just call out, then it would kind of dissipate and it would kind of go away. I, I didn't see him, but I'd always hear him. And I just, hey, my feeling was that it was Bob. I, I never felt threatened in the house. I didn't get the heebie-jeebies. It was just one of those things where I felt like I knew this person in life. So it to me, it was perfectly plausible that he was there visiting in the afterlife. He probably hadn't worked out that he'd passed away yet because he was probably still in grief. We had a crawl space in the closet in my room. And I remember in the middle of summer in the Midwest, just I'm sure it's the same there in Ohio. I mean, it's hot, it's humid, uh, 90 degrees plus, Mm -hmm. and you just feel like you're in a sauna. Well, I pushed open this crawl space because I was curious as to what was up in the roof. And Al, this really cold draft of air came out of it, probably 40 or 50 degrees. And it's about one in the afternoon. And I'm thinking, there's no way on God's green earth that this is natural because you've got uh, you've got the old uh, shaker tiles on the roof with the tar. They're soaking up that heat. There is no way it's that cool in the roof. So I put that crawl space back and never, never wanted anything else to do with going up there. Well, uh, this all kind of culminated. We lived there. I lived there about two years in that house. And uh, as I got to be a little bit older, got a license and started drinking with my friends and that and being a bit more of a nuisance, uh, but nothing too, too bad. Well, we were all there one day and my parents were away in California. So nowhere, anywhere near the house. And I had an older friend who was 21 and I had three younger friends and we'd been drinking and listening to music and that. And so me and my older friend said, we're going to go into town and get some, get some beer. And, uh, I said to these guys, jokingly, I said, you know, keep it down. Don't make too much noise because Bob's not going to like it. So we went away and we were gone about half an hour and we got back and the three of these guys are sitting on the couch, just really pale and sitting really close together, not saying anything. And I walked in and I said, well, what's happened to you guys? What cats got your tongue? And they said, no, no, no. We, we heard noise. I said, well, where did you hear the noise? And they said, up upstairs, we heard footsteps and it sounded like someone came running down the stairs. And I said, well, were you making noise in that at the time? They said, yeah. I said, well, I told you this is Bob's house and he obviously didn't like it. So you need to be quiet. Well, I'll tell you what, after that, Al, if any of my friends came around, any of these three guys came around, if I needed to go somewhere, even if they didn't want to go, they would go outside and wait on the sidewalk. They would not stay in that house. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I never had any negative interactions. I didn't ever see like a full-blown apparition or anything, but you know, I'm sure you understand this. When you're in a home and someone else is there, be it a family member, a friend or whatever, I don't know about everyone, but for me, I have a feeling that I'm not alone in that home. But if no one's home, you have a slightly different feeling. Well, I never felt alone in that home. And to me, look, I'm convinced that it was it was Bob and Bob stayed there. And really weird things like we had the old slide wooden windows that locked into place. So what I'm saying is not something that the wind could, it might blow it closed, but it wasn't going to blow it open. Mm -hmm. And there were times I could hear the window opening in the spare room that we kept locked by the way. And I'd go and get the skeleton key and open it up. And sure enough, the window would be open and we had kept it closed, obviously, because you don't want rain and birds and all that in the room. And I'd just say to Bob, I'd go, oh, you must be hot, Bob. You know, it is quite warm today. And then I'd just leave the window open and I'd leave <laughs> the door open for a few hours. And then I'd go in later and and close it and no issues. 
And I've had some other experiences, but that was probably the one time in my life that I, anyway, I personally felt that I knew who it was. And so it just made that interaction pleasant. Just like I say, like if somebody was visiting, you just, I didn't happen to ever see them, but I definitely saw evidence of it. Now, my stepfather was a pretty devout Mormon and he just kind of laughed it all off and thought that I was doing, you know, drugs or whatever. And, and my mom was a bit more understanding. I don't know if she necessarily believed it, as you were saying before, but she was, she was very supportive. She didn't ever say to me, you got to stop this BS or anything else. She might not have ran around town telling everyone, but on the other hand, she was very supportive about it. Yeah, there's so many similarities that you're talking about. And, you know, it doesn't matter if I talk to people from New Zealand or Australia or England Idaho, you know, it's, or it's the stories are almost all the same. And, uh, I mean, so many similar stories. When I was, the other night I had a guest on and she's taught with me her ghostly experience in her house, kind of similar to yours. I kind of like, she said, are you still there, Al? I mean, cause I wasn't saying nothing. <laughs> I was just, I was kind of like, just, just mesmerized because it sounded like if, when my book comes out, it's like, I stole your story. No, I mean, <laughs> everything in there was what I experienced, everything she said, I experienced. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can, uh, I was just curious, you know, cause, uh, yeah. usually people with paranormal related podcasts somewhere along the line, they've had an experience when they were younger. That's been the interesting bit for me personally, is that you hear so often that someone has an experience like yours and mine where they've experienced something. So let's say you start out with a ghost and then later they might see UFOs or they might see a cryptid or something. But I've only ever felt that I've ever experienced. Now, maybe I'm wrong, you know, because I know there's a bit of a blurry line about are people seeing ghosts or are they seeing sh quote unquote shadow people or whatever. But what I'm saying, Al, is it's not like all of a sudden then I started seeing UFOs. I've, I've never seen a UFO. It doesn't mean that I doubt people's stories. I just I personally have never seen anything that I can remember that I couldn't explain or within a few seconds of looking at it, you go, right, that's a shooting star or that's a satellite or whatever. But yeah, that, I mean, first off, that's really interesting to me that so many people have one kind of experience and then they end up, it's, it's almost like it opens their eyes to see other things. And then the second thing that's really interesting to me when we get to a lot of these things is like you're saying, it, it doesn't seem to matter where you are in the world kind of what your religious background is. Uh, a lot of people, even in places that don't believe in it, they'll have some experience. They may label it differently because of their religion, but they still have an experience. And as you're saying, when you go and compare notes, it's very similar. I mean, it's like me. I've had people say to me before, oh, well, what do you do to attract or, or where do you go to look for? And it's no, 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 no. Look, folks, every, every instance in my life where I've had a kind of ghostly encounter, I've just been doing my thing. I've just been living my life. And all of a sudden the hairs will start raising on my arms or on the back of my neck. And I'll go, okay, something's a bit odd here. It's not like I go looking for it. It's more like they find me. And I've had some experiences here in New Zealand. I, I had some in California. It seems like everywhere I go sooner or later, I do have some kind of experience, but I never go looking for it. I'm, I'm not the guy that's out in the graveyard at midnight, you know, with the, with the candles and that. No, 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 no. It's just, I'm living my life. And then all of a sudden somebody like knocks on the door and says, Hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> you mentioned the UFOs and what are your thoughts on the uh, newly released Pentagon UFO report? <laughs> well, look, it, it, it's funny. And I think I, I don't want to speak for you, but just you having been through some of these uh, cases and that, that uh, look pretty darn concrete. The, the thing to me, I said to people, because I've had many other podcasts kind of reach out to me and say to me, oh, you're the UFO expert. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Look, I've, I've, I've always had an interest in it. I study a lot on these things and I present a lot of cases that people might not know a lot about, but I'm not Jacques Vallée. I'm not anyone else like that. But I said very early on, I thought that basically that report was basically going to be a lot of smoke and mirrors and not a lot else. And sure enough, that's what came out of it. Because my personal feeling is that out of all the UFO cases, you can probably pretty easily explain 95 to 97, 98% of them. But those other 2% are very persistent. And the thing to me is that I would argue just from what I've seen over the years, people I've talked to and people like 
Jacques Vallée, Art Bell, and some of these other people out there that know a lot more than me, I would argue that almost all of the real data on UFOs is either in people's personal hands, meaning people like Robert Bigelow, it's not in the government's hands, or it's in a government spinoff type entity, which means when you go and file a Freedom of Information Act, they can ignore it because they're a private business. They're not a U.S government entity. So they can then go, oh, well, this is none of my business. Or if it's in someone's private collection, again, you can't go and file a Freedom of Information Act against someone personally and get anything out of it if they don't work for the government. So yeah, I I think it's been the old shell game. And I think a lot of the things that over the years are actually concrete and that they do know about are just kind of shuffled off the board. And again, I would argue that uh, a lot of the things that have happened over the year years, they've also probably destroyed information that they've had in different files and memos. I was much more interested about the the CIA file dump that was dumped through Black Vault. And mm-hmm. I've I've read a few of those. If you go through and you'll see my show list and you'll say you'll see, I think it's called like CIA files. That's me literally out going through these files, just taking one out at random and then reading the file and talking about it on the air and what my thoughts are. I found some pretty significant things in there that kind of blow my mind. I mean, things from kind of prominent scientists at the time, there's a direct tie-in of that stuff back to right field. As much as people always say that the whole right field thing is always a like an urban legend or a myth. I mean, these files say that the ATIC, and I always forget the acronym, but it's it's basically the group that was studying these phenomena in the 50s. That group was based at Wright Field. So it's there. I mean, it's there in black and white in CIA released documents that are 100% authentic. So anyone who's saying, oh, there's no tie-in, well, there's your tie-in right there. I'll be right back with my conversation with JT from the Paranormal Sun. We'll continue talking about the Pentagon's UFO release and plus much, much more. Are you fascinated by true crime like us? If so, check out our podcast, Crime Divers, hosted by me, Jill. And me, Laura. Look out for new episodes every Tuesday when we discuss true crime from around the world. So what are you waiting for? Come join us as we dive in. What really interests me, you know, besides the files, and sometimes you don't know if it's uh, a conspiracy or if it's a real deal, but being dumped by the CIA, I'm I'm thinking it's a real deal. But going back to 9-11, I remember I was in Florida when that happened. My sister-in-law's neighbor, you know, he came over and we, he brought over a bottle of uh, whiskey (laughs) and uh, (laughs) he says, uh, well, he says, we got this, we got the talk and, you know, and he, and turns out he was asking, you know, I see the air force here all the time. He's an older gentleman back then he was older, retired from the air force. And uh, where do you know where they come and they put gas in your car, they bring you groceries and they took care of him. Right. I'm thinking, I said, what did you do in the air force, man? Here he worked uh, at Roswell during that crash. And he told, you know, he could only tell me so much. Yeah. And he says, uh, if I told you everything that I know, I'd have to kill you. And I'm, I'm like, I started laughing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of a scary, chilling thing he said, but you know, he says anything and everything on that crash is at the Wright Patterson air force base. Right. And he said, the chilling part of all that is the cover up on the cover up. Yeah. So when you, when you hear about, you know, those type of people that live through that telling me that it actually happened. Yeah. And because of the freedom of information act, they still can't talk about it. Yeah, and that's, that's the scary bit because I always love it when uh, – look, I, I make a very big differentiation on my program about skeptics and debunkers, right? No problem at all with skeptics because that's how we should look at these things, right? I mean if we're talking about entities, be they from another planet or another universe or another time, look, we, we do need to look at that with a skeptical eye. But just flat-out debunkers that no matter what the evidence says – just explain it away. I mean, that's, I don't have time for that. But see, this is one of the things that debunkers will constantly say, Al, is that, oh, well, somebody would have talked by now. Well, again, if you're, if, if you're depending on your pension, be it from the police department or the military, and oftentimes, as we all know in the US, especially now, that might be the only way you can afford to get your prescription medication that you need to keep living. Now, are you really going to go out there and throw your life in the in the trash can just to be ridiculed by someone who says, 
oh, well, th- th- he's just full of it anyway. So you've gone out there, you've exposed yourself, you've, you've, you may have lost your pension because as you say, you've spoken out against a non-disclosure or something you signed 30, 40, 50 years ago. Even worse, you get a little bit of recognition. You still get dumped on by people in the public who are kind of amateur know-it-alls. And at the same time, then you've got the people in your circle don't want to talk to you because they say, well, you spilled the beans and you were supposed to shut up. So, I, I mean, to me, that's one of the things I always say to people is that, well, there, there, there's your reasoning for most of this. I mean, even people that work as contractors, we all know if you're an electrician or, or you're a mechanic and you go and work on a military base, you're still going to have to sign a non-disclosure. That's how it works if you do work for the government. And when they look at that and they say afterwards, look, this is nothing we had. This has to have been from elsewhere in the in the universe. I mean, what more proof do you want than the converted? You know, I, I know you don't have an ashtray, as Art Bell used to say, we don't have an <laughs> ashtray from the from the UFO. But that's pretty darn convincing to me. And again, there's this kind of there, there's this new wave with a lot of skeptics, but more debunkers that say, well, a policeman or a fighter pilot, they're no more of a trained observer than anyone else. And in fact, they're worse because they're used to seeing things in the sky. So they just trust what they see. It's like, hang on. So we're depending on these people to defend us as a nation or as a, as a private citizen. But now you're telling me that they're actually a worse observer than Jim Johnson or, you know, Joe Sixpack. It's like, no, come on. You can't have it both ways. I'm sorry. I, I just don't buy that. Why, if it's a weather balloon, yeah. if, if it's no big deal, what, you know, come on, say, hey, put something out there that, you know, to defend yourself. Reputable people, just like these pilots chasing these things in the Pentagon report, you know, this is a billion dollar aircraft, highly trained pilots. And what they did, they got disoriented and they're trained for this <laughs> yeah, and yeah. their equipment is uh, faulty. And they're the best of the best. Yeah. Cause they're on the, on the carriers. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, <laughs> exactly. I want I want to get your take on that, you know? And yeah, I do, uh, I do check out the uh, black vault. Pretty inter- interesting. There's some of the stuff that's on there. Well, um, a- a- as you were saying, look, I fully agree. This is the thing to me. The first thing that people who just want to explain this all away with a couple or three or four explanations. One of the first things they've got to remember is almost all of these police officers and military people are very, very hesitant to report it because it damages their career. And I know that for a fact because I've I've had family members in the military. I've had family members in the police force. And if you talk about anything slightly abnormal, the first the first instance is, oh, well, you don't want to promote that guy because he's a nut job. And the problem being, I mean, you understand this, Al, but a lot of the listeners might live in big cities. But when you live in a small community like we have, word gets around real quick. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to other people who, as we all know, they'll shut up about something they've seen, be it a ghost, be it a UFO, be it a cryptid, for 40, 50, 60 years because they're afraid they'll lose their job. They're afraid they'll be ridiculed in church, everything else. And, you know, things like the UFOs, I mean, it's just to me – over the years, what I tend to do on the show is I cover a lot of these lesser known cases. So what I tend to do is I kick off a new season with a more well-known case, and then I'll do a lot of these cases that people hadn't heard of. Well, it's just like the Lonnie Zamora case. Every time I start investigating one of these, I'll go, well, I know most of what happened, and there's going to be very little new information that I find out. And every time, Al, that I get into the weeds and I investigate and I read things that have come up, I find out something new. And it's like Lonnie Zamora. And for those of the listeners that don't know, he's one of the most famous UFO cases. He had a blue, he had a blue book case and he was the police officer in New Mexico that had a sighting in 1964. Well, for years and years, the the kind of standard debunker line has been that, well, Lonnie Zamora was the only one who saw it. He made it up for fame and fortune. Well, first off, he got so tired of talking about it after the first few years. If anyone approached him to talk about the UFO, he refused to do an interview. He said, look, I said everything that I I wanted to say. I don't want to talk about it. It's basically ruined my life. Secondly, it's come out in the interim. In fact, J. Allen Hynek actually found out when he investigated that another one of the officers, when he arrived on the scene, actually saw this thing going off in the distance. But he refused to say it on the record because, again, he didn't want to be lumped in the quote unquote nut job basket. 
there were also people who were driving on the highway that saw this thing go over the top and they stopped at the at the gas station and as you say back in the days it was full service the owner comes out to fill the tank and the guy goes to him well, those are funny helicopters you've got around here. And the owner of the gas station said, well, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, this helicopter just flew over us about two or 300 feet over the highway. And uh, we didn't know what to think about it. But he said, well, are you sure it's a helicopter? He goes, oh, come to think of it. It didn't have any rotors or anything. And it wasn't transparent. I couldn't see anyone in, inside. So again, all I'm saying is that oftentimes when you look into these cases, Al, like you say, things that are very easily explained away by the media in general, like, oh, it was swamp gas, or it was the balloon, or it's just people getting drunk. I mean, I, I remember the Phoenix Lights, and I was living in Southern California when it happened. And because you couldn't just explain this away as a meteor or something, straight away, uh, they're joking around, well, it is almost St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, this is 1997. And up until a couple, two, three years ago, when the Pentagon stuff started breaking, as you say, that was the narrative for years and years. Oh, they must have been drunk. They must have been on drugs. Uh, they must be illiterate rednecks that don't know what they're seeing. Is anyone can look at the sky and see a star? It's a lot different to see something that's you know zooming over your head like these policemen saw. It's a lot different thing that that when you're actually chasing these objects. And again, I've read some of these blue book files that are just absolutely ridiculous. Things like that. There was a famous case, one that they basically uh, based the Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the opening story where you got the policeman chasing the, the UFOs. I think that case was also in Ohio. And that was one of the things, yeah, the Air Force said, oh, they were they were chasing Venus or the planet Mars. It's like, really? You think that these police officers wouldn't work out after a few miles that this thing wasn't moving? Yeah, uh, it, it just... I, I understand how and why these intelligence agencies have done it, but just to, to look at that and say, oh, this explains everything as a layman, it, it just it, it hurts my head that you can look at that explanation and go, OK, this solves everything. And for those people who say, why would they cover things up and how do you know the CIA or the FBI is involved? Well, I'll tell you why, because when you look into things like nuclear accidents that we've had over the years, broken arrows, like, you know, planes that have gone down with nukes on board or nuclear meltdowns that have happened in various places, they all follow a very similar pattern to how these UFO cases are covered up. As you say, first you deny, 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 then you launch a cover story. And then if you have to, you just keep adjusting the cover story to keep people off the track. Because again, we I mean, we have real world evidence of these things happening. Like uh, when one of the Air Force planes lost a nuclear bomb in Spain and they kind of covered it up and they kept changing the cover story. And then it was like, hush, hush, we'll only buy out who we have to. So what I'm saying is you can see if you look into the evolution of a lot of these purported UFO cover ups, they follow that very same pattern that a lot of governmental agencies do on a daily basis. So in my mind, their fingerprints are all over a lot of these things. I was listening to your later episodes and you gave Harry Reid a shout out. And, oh, yes. Uh, yes. I, uh, I really uh, appreciate that you did that because uh, Harry Reid, among other people, you know, are keeping these sightings alive and the importance of yeah. starting a, you know, a program to keep on investigating these sightings, not only in the United States, but they're worldwide. Yes, everywhere. You're right. No, look, I, I, I fully agree. And any politician, especially someone as connected as Harry Reid, that takes the time to air this publicly and do interviews on the, I mean, he's not been one of those people who just said, let's do a Senate committee to kind of tick a box and tell people we've looked into it. I mean, he he's done interviews. He's talked to people in the public. And as I say, my opinion is that he's basically endangered himself all the way along. Now, does that mean that I expected some guys in black suits to come and shoot him. No, but what I'm saying is he's endangered his pension. He's endangered his reputation. Uh -huh. He's endangered finding out about other. I, I've got no doubt you start talking about those things in public. And then Harry Reid goes and says, look, I want to know about this project, but it's top secret. And they go, well, we don't know if we should let you know about that because you've talked about UFOs and you might be a security risk. So in my opinion, he deserves every accolade that he gets, as you say, he's kept these things alive and he's led some, he, he, he's lent some really big credibility to it because this is not just some junior congressman from Wyoming that was in for four years. You know, this is a guy who's been deeply ensconced in the apparatus of Washington. And I really appreciate the fact that 
he not only did he bring it to the forefront, but he did it without the kind of sly chuckle that so many people do. Uh, like when the Phoenix Lights happened and then the governor comes out with his aide dressed as, you know, this ridiculous alien with this huge head in that and says, oh, we <laughs> caught the culprit. And again, I know there are reasons why they do those things. But for someone like Harry Reid to treat it seriously, I had the utmost respect for him. And I go on my tirades about the government on the show. And and what I mean is I don't mean Democrats or Republicans. I mean everyone uh -huh. and about them doing what's best for them and not necessarily what's best for us. And I've, I've had people say to me off the air, well, why would the government cover up these things? Well, to me, it's very simple. We all and our parents and our grandparents all paid tax dollars our whole lives to the government. And one of the key things the government's supposed to do in response is protect us and defend us. So if you've got these objects that are kind of doing whatever the heck they want in, in our atmosphere, in the most protected airspace in the world, in the U.S., They've been cited over nuclear missile bases. There's claims that they've shut down nuclear missiles. There's claims they've shot down fighter jets and everything else. Well, if they can do all that and we can do nothing against them, why should Jim Johnson send in his taxes? I mean, so on a very simple basis, there's one of your major answers because I've had people, oh, well, it makes no sense why, would the, why they would deny or cover things up. And the amount of times that I've had, you get these official responses like the they said that i don't know if it was in that latest congressional report but they said oh it poses no threat to national security really really i'm pretty sure it does you know oh, I just agree. because it, yeah yeah just because it hasn't blown anything up doesn't mean it doesn't pose a threat for goodness sakes you know it's uh, but getting off the ufo topic for a second i was surfing through your uh, facebook page what happens when you die that picture of an old yeah. man exiting one door and a young boy entering another in the sky. I know some people will say, well, the paranormal, you know, you've got the name, the paranormal son, but you cover this other stuff as well. Well, the whole idea was, I mean, I, I know the idea behind your podcast name, Al, but uh, as the old saying goes, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. And the paranormal son is to me, it sums it up what you know it, it's not all about ghosts it's about everything in the related fields but instead of writing ufos and ancient mysteries and 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 it's just keep it simple so i have had people say to me oh i didn't realize you cover this or that and as as with all of us that i've got a very deep interest in past life stories past life regressions reincarnation it's not anything that i personally had that i can recall but it's just some of these stories that are just, if they're made up, I mean, the the families, the children involved in everything else, they just deserve like a, a gold star award. They deserve the best Oscars for acting because some of these cases, I mean, they're astounding. There, there was one that I covered. I've done four or five different episodes on this now. And one of the cases that I covered was a young boy and from a very, very young age, about the age three or four, he kept telling his mom that he lived in Hollywood, that he was a uh, he was a, an actor, he was in movies. And one day they were looking through a book and he saw this guy and he goes, that's me. And he didn't point at the star. So, you know, he didn't point at the Charlie Chaplin. He pointed at the bit actor in the background. And they started looking into this and it turned out that this person had been a bit of a bit actor because he was an agent and he'd represented a lot of people in Hollywood. And the interesting thing was, Al, when you kind of went through this boy's checklist of, it was 57 or 58 claims that he made about his past life, and like 54 of them, they verified. And one of the ones that was the most astounding to me was, he said something along the lines, now I might have not have the exact number right, but he said to his mom, and again, this is like a four or five-year-old boy saying this, he goes, I've never understood why God would let a man live to be 61 years old and then have him die and come back as a boy. When they kind of compared notes on this uh, individual, and I th I know one of them was named Marty Martin, but I can't remember if that, I think that was the, the guy that lived in the 30s. Well, when they looked into it, they said, aha, well, you're wrong because Marty Martin lived to be 62 or something like that. Well, when they actually looked into it, they found out, this is the astounding part to me, they found out through family records that his death certificate was wrong, and he actually only lived to be the, the age that the boy said. So there is no way on God's green earth he could have known this because the public records in his tombstone said the wrong age when the boy knew the right age. And to me, things like that, how could you 
how, how could you make that up? And again, this is before the age of the internet. And again, even if he looked it up online and they rehearsed this story, they would have gotten it wrong. And so many of these people that have these past life memories, the really interesting bit to me is like there's a girl in India that had a past life story. And basically in the past life, when the person who she claims to have been in the past life, the, the, the day that that person passes away, that's when they cease having knowledge about the old family. So she went and visited this family that she was sure that she had been the mother of in a previous life. And she talked about the home where they live. She talked about this, that, and the other. And when they turned up, they had done renovations to the home since she had passed away. And there had been some other changes. And she didn't know anything about that. But up until the date of the death, she knew all kinds of things. And they did things like they tried to trick her by saying they had someone turn up at the train station and said, oh, this was your husband. And she said, no, it wasn't. That's my husband's cousin. Now, again, if you're getting a five or six or seven-year-old girl to rehearse these things, how are you going to know that? So, yeah, some of these cases, Al, they're just so astounding to me. And as with anything, I'm sure there are some in there that you can explain them, okay? But it to me, to borrow a saying from Richard Hoagland, who used to be on Art Bell all the time, it only pr takes one white crow to prove that not all crows are black. <laughs> and that's what I keep saying on the show. You don't need thousands of cases. It only takes one to prove that there's something else going on. Now, as I always say to the audience on my show, I don't have all the answers. And at the end of the day, the final judgment is not up to me. It's here's the facts. Here's what I found out. Here's what the investigation of years and years and years show. And you be the final judge because we're all adults. We're all intelligent adults that can make up our own mind. It's just here's what I found out. And I find it extremely fascinating. As with anyone, I've got my own opinions on the matter, but I don't generally disclose those on the air because I don't want to tell people this is how you should think. I want them to make their own opinion on it. So, you know, you're with that picture kind of just brought back something to me, like, you know, everything isn't black and white, you know, sometimes you have to look into the gray area. Yes. And sometimes your answers are in that gray area. Oh, definitely. So it's not just black and white, you know, and that's why I found out with this podcast, you know, cause like, like you, and it's, it's not all only on ghosts and spirits. And I mean, the parent paranormal is such a wide field. I mean, yes. So, you know, sometimes I, I learn off my guest, you know, like I never knew, I never knew, even knew a, a Faye was until last year when I had uh, two guests on, both of them were Faye, a Faye witch, you know, and uh, so I learn a lot off of some, a few, you know, a lot of my guests and that's to me, I love learning and, and getting other people's uh, perspectives and your points of view on it and, and letting you have your voice that will maybe they're going through the same thing that you you're going through, whether it be ghosts or spirits, or you've seen a UFO or you've been abduct, abducted. I mean, right. so they might've went through the same thing that you're talking about, but would never ever mention it to their family or coworkers or friends. So I, I really, I really uh, like your podcast because you're kind of everywhere. Like I am, I don't say out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can, you're, you're kind of everywhere. Like I am letting people share their points of view on your, on your podcast. And to me, Al, I, it's just my personal opinion, but I, I feel as you do, that is really key because I've always said, look, you want to come on the podcast and you want to talk about anything. If you want to come and talk about flat earth, you can come on the show as long as you're respectful. Don't call me. Don't call the audience idiots because they don't believe what you believe. And it's the same vice versa. And I will extend you that same hospitality. I mean, that's how I look at it. I, it's just like anything. We're all going to have our own opinions. And I'm sure there are things that I've said. I'm sure there have told heard people who have by now heard my stories of Bob and said, oh, it's all BS. He's made it up. And that's fine. I mean, that's what the world's about. Uh, I've never, I'll never forget. There's an old far side comic. I loved the far side and it had the world and it was like in a kitchen and there's God standing there with a chef's hat. Right. And he's got all of these kind of spice jars. And they say like, good people, uh, nice people, everything else. And he's got this shaker jar and he goes now just to spice things up a bit. And it says jerks on the side and he's like shaking it on the earth. So what, <laughs> what I'm getting at is all of our different opinions to me is what makes life one interesting. And two, as you say, so often we, as we go through life and we kind of learn and grow, our viewpoints change and, and we might take on a different perspective. And I'm like you, I mean, 
Al, there's not an episode I do that I don't learn something, whether it's through a guest or it's through researching mm-hmm. uh, show topics. And that's part of the thing that just keeps me going. I, look, I fully agree. And, and again, at the end of the day, if I have listeners say to me, we want you to cover this. Uh, for example, when the monolith thing was happening, look, in my mind, I was 99.999% sure that it had nothing to do with aliens or time travelers or every, anything else. But lots of people were fascinated by it. So and that was my it. last question to you. That was my last question. <laughs> Can you explain to my listeners what a monolith is? Sure. The term monolith, really why people were calling these newfangled metal platform type uh, pedestals, monoliths was uh, a, a callback to the iconic 2001 movie and the books before that. And in those stories... Uh, it was said that basically another group, call them aliens, call them whatever you want to do, placed these monoliths in different places. One of them was on Earth. And the idea was that it would take at the time they, you know, in the movie, they said that humans were primates. So we were apes. And it would basically say that by having this monolith there, it would allow the consciousness of that species to evolve into a higher level. Throughout the movie, they find them in different places. I, I, I'm i pretty sure they found one on the moon, and then they find one close to Jupiter, either Jupiter or one of the moons. And basically, this group says, leave these things alone. They're not for you. Basically, it's the whole homage to say, we're creating another species that's going to be intelligent elsewhere in your galaxy, or sorry, in your solar system. So when these things started coming out, and it was the first one was spotted in the Utah desert. And the whole enigma to everyone was it was kind of out in the middle of nowhere. We're not talking about like the Grand Canyon with the main, like a freeway exit to it. We're talking, I think they said it's about 35 to 40 minutes, kind of four by four or off road to get there. And it just turned up in this, on this plateau on like a Department of Conservation um, uh, piece of land. And it was basically a metal, like a triangular piece of metal, almost like a statue, but it was dug into the bedrock and somebody just turned up and and put it there and no one knew why. And so it really captured people's imaginations all over the world. And within a few days, you started having these monoliths, for lack of a better term, popping up all over. I mean, Romania was one of the first places. And then you had one on the Isle of Wight in the UK. You had one turn up in downtown Las Vegas on the Strip. You had one in Southern California. And it was really fascinating to me. And the reason I say that, Al, is there have been things in my life that I've known about when they happen, like we were talking about the Phoenix Lights or the Hudson Valley UFO sightings or more recently the Pentagon stuff. But to actually kind of see the whole narrative around these monoliths evolving in front of my eyes as I'm covering it, it was really fascinating because you could just see people jumping on board all over the world. And in the end, uh, I think almost all of them were explained away by artists basically taking advantage of that initial one and saying that this is an art exhibition. And I do believe it's never been 100% confirmed, but they were saying that the original monolith would have been an art installation of some type. And it wasn't meant to like get a bunch of attention. It was more like a, here's an Easter egg. Here's a secret out in the desert. And if you go through all the hard work of going out here to hike and everything else, this is just here. It's just a bit of mystery in our kind of day-to-day mundane lives. And I, I think at the end of the day, I've been asked before, why are people so interested in UFOs? Why are people so interested in the paranormal? And I think when you get down to all of it and you get to the seat of it, it's everyone loves a good mystery. We all love a mystery in our world that is where 99.5% of everything we deal with on a day-to-day basis is explained, and we know about it. We might not be a computer technician, but we know when we turn on our laptop that there's not magic involved or there's not fairies inside running the laptop. So when we've got something like this that just is, is a mystery, be it the Loch Ness Monster, be it a UFO, be it these monoliths. I just think that at the end of the day, that's what people latch onto. It's just a little bit of mystery. It's a little bit of something different in our day-to-day lives. I totally agree. The paranormal is the unexplained. Yeah. I want to thank you very much for for coming on tonight, JT, and sharing your stories and educating me a little bit. And I wish you the best of luck on the uh, Paranormal Sun podcast. 
and you're doing a hell of a job and keep on keeping on. Thank you, Al, for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Number one, number two, Hey, someday we'll have you on when you want to come on, especially once you've got your your novel written and you can get a bit of uh, get a bit of word of mouth out there about it. You're welcome to come on the show. And like I say, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's the same with you. I mean, I really love the way you approach Ghosts in the Valley and just your width and depth of experience and knowledge in these things as well. It's just, you know, I, I've really enjoyed listening so far and I'll continue to. And like I say, you know, I did about a four. I did a four-part series on stuff that was mainly in Western Pennsylvania, no Ohio stuff. But I will get to Ohio one day. I've got a backlog of just hundreds of subjects to cover. But I will be adding this um, the, that 1994 UFO encounter into uh, my backlog because that's definitely something I want to cover. It's a fascinating one. There's just tons of stories out there like that. And Ohio is full of paranormal, just like every other state, you know. Oh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, man. I, I appreciate it. And thanks for the kind words. Well, there's one there too, just before I go, that's happened in Minnesota. And I know you're working through the catalog, but it's called Something Just Hit My Car. And it's the Val Johnson case in 1979. And he actually, his squad car collided with something. And it's like they've actually the squad car to this day is in a museum in Minnesota. And you can see it was impacted by something. And he ran off the road into a ditch. They took photos of the skid marks and everything else. So like and and I've had people from Minnesota get in a hold of me and say, I'm of the age that I should have known about this, but I, I'd never even heard of this case. So like you say, it is fascinating when you start looking. And like you say, Al, it's it's not only UFOs, obviously, it's ghosts and all these other things, but it is worldwide. I can tell you we've got famous UFO cases here and in Australia, and I've covered some of them. So yeah, look, it's it's definitely and it's great that like you, uh, you 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 look at it and you say, hey, look, folks, this is worldwide because it's easy no matter what country we're in to focus on where we live, of course. So again, thank you, Al. Thanks so much. I do appreciate it. Keep in touch, definitely. Thank you, JT. If you haven't listened to the Paranormal Sun podcast, please do so. Put it in your library. Give it a listen. There's a lot of cool stories on there. And JT is one heck of a host. Thank you, JT. I know we'll talk again. It was my pleasure having you on today. And please go to the links below and check out The Paranormal Sun on everywhere you get your podcast. I'm your host, Al Cooley. I'll see you in two weeks with another great episode on Ghosts in the Valley podcast. (laughs) 